All right. And the Industrial Revolution is, again, a gigantic topic, much like all the other topics we're going to be doing in here. We're going to try to do in an hour. Um, you know, you'd spend the rest of your life studying the French Revolution or Napoleon, and I know people have done it, uh, or the Industrial Revolution. This is just a gigantic thing that, again, we're going to talk about the you know, big mountaintop uh, kind of highlights and skip past most of the details as fast as possible. So my goal is to get through not just describing what the Industrial Revolution did and how it's changed our lives radically up till today, um, but also talk about the major criticism of the Industrial Revolution, and that's the big guy, Karl Marx. So we're going to try to get through a whole lot uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, the Question? No, okay. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is powerful because before it hit, before it occurred, and even in places that are not so much industrialized today, the major mode of making stuff was physical muscle labor, either through animals plowing fields, you know, you hook up your plow to a horse's back and smack the horse around, and they pull the plow through the ground, and that digs down. That was the fastest mode of planting seeds possible. It was literal muscle labor. Um, what do they do today? And these gigantic trucks with these huge uh, machines that just till the soil as they go forward. And it's, it's industrialized now. Um, and that's what industrialization means. It means taking the labor that is done by muscles, either by humans you know, digging in the ground or animals muscle labor doing it, and they convert that to machine work. And of course you have to fuel the machine somehow. So we'll talk about that in detail. But uh, it has revolutionized the world. Human societies did not change much. From the earliest cities in Mesopotamia and India um, up until about the year 1800. Most people were farmers and the daily life of an average person was to wake up at about dawn and go out into the field and do something in the field to raise food for the year. That's what most people did. If you didn't do that, you maybe worked in a workshop if you had some kind of big skill and you like, made tables, you made chairs, you made all the stuff that society used physically on a daily basis. So you're either a kind of tool maker or a tool user in the field. Um, the clothes were made by people sitting in chairs, literally knitting. So you can imagine it took a long time to make a shirt or a sweater, and most people didn't own many sets of clothes because they were expensive, because you had to pay someone so many hours for that labor, right? So a lot of just physical goods that we see as commonplace and throw away on a daily basis were very expensive back then because they were rare. It took a lot of money and a lot of time and muscle labor to make them. And the Industrial Revolution changes that because you start making clothes mass produced by machines, tables, chairs, I mean all kinds of stuff today even up to very complex tools like computers, cell phones. Almost all that stuff is made by machine today. So uh, that's the major transition and that's why we have material prosperity for the most part, right? Almost everything we're physically touching right now is made in a factory somewhere. Your clothes, your shoes, the tables, the chairs, the pens and pencils you're using, the paper you're touching, everything that is physically around you is for the most part made in a factory. Everything that is produced somewhere is manufactured in an industrial factory somewhere. And that is a radical change from the way people lived um, up until about 200 years ago. So that is the big thing about industrialization. That's what it does. It takes muscle labor out of the equation and puts it onto the machines. This was upsetting for a lot of people. Um, to go back even before the Industrial Revolution gets kick-started, um, the normal way of life for a lot of people throughout human history has been living in common. If you have animals that needed to graze, either to feed the animals to make them strong and healthy enough to you know, pull the plow through the fields, or to raise, say, sheep or goats or cattle or something like that for food itself, to slaughter for food. Oftentimes, communities had this open land where they would allow their animals to graze freely. Even under feudalism feudal lords would leave aside some common land for the peasants or uh, the landowners to allow their animals to graze. This was a very common practice. A lot of this starts changing, first in uh, especially Britain, where the landowners 
start taking away the common land. And they start splitting it up into small pieces and selling it on the open land market for personal profit. So you start seeing what comes to be known as the enclosure movement. They're literally enclosing the land. They're putting up fences around that common land to keep the people's animals out, to keep uh, the common access to the land out. And you can see from this picture, you start seeing large fences and whatnot, cutting the land up into smaller pieces for use in different ways. So they're literally not allowing the common people to use a lot of these lands anymore. And the common people are outraged by it. They view it as oppressive, as the rich people coming down and taking their livelihood away, which in a lot of ways it was. So the enclosure movement is very controversial, and it spreads generally to much of the rest of Europe in the late 1700s. So during the 1800s, you see a lot of philosophers and economists talking about enclosure as being one of the first major steps in industrialization because they're you know, taking away the means of production the means of farming from the people and you know, keeping it for themselves. And this is something that Karl Marx especially will talk about to a great extent. Uh, so do you see the differences between those two systems? Common land versus enclosure? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the Napoleonic Code largely got rid of feudalism, especially in France, um, and exported it to the areas he conquered, as we talked about last time in Napoleon's kind of empire in general. Uh, he brought kind of free land-based capitalism to Western Europe and brought that system into Central Europe, uh, especially in the places that he had direct control over. So he does bring a lot of social change and greater liberties because without feudalism, people can move around freely and they can choose who they work for. Whereas in feudalism, you're a peasant who signed on to serve a lord for your life. So the further east you go in Europe, that those eastern lands, Napoleon did not have as much control over. Austria, Russia, down into the Balkans. So you see a lot of free kind of capitalistic styles in the western European areas uh, to a kind of combination of capitalism and serfdom in the central areas where you had some control over but not complete and not nearly as much um, destruction of feudalism in the east where he had very kind of weak control over. And this is one of the long-term legacies of Napoleon's era. And still today, when you look at the map of Europe economically, the least industrialized parts and the more kind of old economy parts are in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, right down to this very moment. So there's still a lot of feudalism going on in Eastern Europe right into the late 1800s, if not the early 1900s. So that's one of the long-term effects of Napoleon's reign. So that's uh, kind of continental relations with the land and economics and whatnot. Um, the European population was growing, and it was growing very fast. And there were many economic fears, especially by a guy named Malthus, Thomas Malthus in the early 1800s, who gave these projections that the European population is growing so fast they're not going to have enough food to feed all these people. So he's talking about threats of famine, social collapse, all kinds of you know, uh, you know, Armageddon type scenarios. And he was making the study economically. Uh, one thing really rises in Europe in the early 1800s that prevents a lot of that starvation and increases the food supply dramatically, and this is the growth of potatoes. Um, potatoes do a lot of different things. Number one, they are cheap and they grow easily in fairly cold and damp climates, especially like Northern Europe, Britain, and particularly Ireland. They grow like crazy there. So they are largely a North American crop that when the discoveries in New World are made, they start bringing them over, but uh, the potato doesn't grow into a, be a real popularly used thing until the early 1800s. The real trick that they do is they're not just cheap and easy to grow, but they regenerate land. When you keep growing the same crop or a whole lot of crop on the same land year in and year out for hundreds and hundreds of years, you suck up all the natural resources out of the land, all the kind of natural things that the crops need to grow. So in the 1700s, 
Europe was experiencing fewer and fewer uh, levels of food, lower crop yields as the years went on, as the century went on. And that was one thing that particularly pointed, that Malthus pointed out, saying, look, we've got a big problem on our hands. But when they start growing potatoes in certain parts of the land, the potatoes regenerate that food uh, source, regenerate the land, so it is like fresh land again. So what they would normally do is split their land up into pieces and say, grow the normal crops one year in one or two areas, and in the third area, they grow potatoes. And that potato rejuvenates the land, and then they you know, replant there the next year, move the potato crop over to the other plots. So they rotate their plots. So the potato is also very useful because it's cheap, nearly anyone can grow it, and the next year you can get more crop out of that land. Does that make sense? Or two years later, whenever your kind of agreed term is. Uh, another big thing is that there's a whole lot of poor people in Europe and their diet moves to normally potatoes because they're so cheap. Anyone can grow them so they're easy, cheap to buy at market and if you have even a small plot of land you can grow a bunch of potatoes and avoid starvation. So a lot of the European cyclical famines that had hit uh, largely start petering out in the 1800s because you have this whole new food supply. And uh, the more you regenerate the land uh, the more cattle you can raise or more kind of animals you can raise, which obviously only grows the food supply that much more. So the potato is a giant deal to Europe. So questions about that one at all? I forgot number five. Number vodka. five. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can make vodka out of potatoes somehow. But you know, they make vodka of all kinds of things. Uh, most vodkas uh, in Europe are made out of... Uh, Grain, I believe, uh, wheat, barley. Um, Japan, they are rice, right? East yeah. East Asia is mostly rice-based. But if you're interested, <laughs> some of us very yeah, much are. Interested. <laughs> yep. Okay, so uh, with the growing amount of food being produced, that only allows more people to survive, which means more people having kids, which means you get an even higher increase in the population. So the population is growing exponentially, uh, very, very fast by the early 1800s. Nothing like what we see happening in the 1900s, but fast compared to uh, previous European history by that point. So the food supply is met by this agricul uh, agricultural changes, uh, enclosure markets, potatoes and other kinds of crops. But people also need clothing. And this booming world population needs more clothes to survive. So clothing makers are encouraged to figure out faster ways of making clothes to sell to more people. And this is the first industry where the Industrial Revolution hits. And it hits particularly in Britain for these many reasons. Britain has a lot of natural advantages to other European countries. Number one is political. They have a stable government. They have a monarchy that's been on the throne by the early 1800s for over 100 years. There's not much threat to that monarchy. And in fact, when they, Britain largely wins the Napoleonic Wars, they're the big winner of the whole thing. Um, Britain is the most powerful country on the planet from 1815 till at least the 1860s. So Britain launches on a path of world power and prosperity that uh, hadn't been largely reached for a long time. Uh, they have a fairly representative government, so there's not many calls for revolution. And because they have a representative government, big business people are largely the ones who have enough money to get elected into office. So the British government is very pro-business. They look to take a a lot of government revenue to support the growth of certain companies. So there is very much a growing merchant class and an entrepreneurial class who are experimenting with new ideas. And a few of them will dramatically succeed, especially uh, those who theorize using machines to make a lot of this stuff. Number two, um, Britain has a long traditional tradition of mercantilism, worldwide sales, they have a gigantic worldwide empire, 
So they have a lot of potential workers. Say poor people from India who don't want to live in India anymore want to go to the prosperous home country, which is Britain. So they have waves of immigration from all over the world. And they also have an enclosure movement that's kicking their own British citizens off the land to a certain extent. So they have a large supply of very possibly cheap wage workers that are um, unemployed and willing to take any job they possibly can. And when the factories start to rise, they are the ones who go into work for the factories. Uh, they have a lot of business investors in a very prosperous country where the rich are very rich and they're looking for opportunities to grow their businesses and make them more efficient. And they also have some natural advantages uh, just in their territory. They have a lot of rivers, which means easy transportation. They are an island, which means uh, before the era of planes, uh, shipping things in boats across water using wind sails is the fastest way to move things, much faster than putting things in a wagon and have an animal or someone try to pull it. So they can move things, goods and resources, all over the island very quickly because of the river system and the fact that they're a fairly small island that you can travel around pretty quickly. So they can move stuff around fast. They have very large natural forests, which means they can build a lot of those boats because boats back then were built out of wood. They have large coal deposits, and coal will become one of the early fuels of the Industrial Revolution. And even in some instances all the way into today. So the very first fuel that they will use for their machines is water. They will build factories next to these rivers, and have you ever seen those big water wheels that they put in the middle of a stream or something? Uh, allow the water to run through the thing that pushes the wheel and that generates the power that they just hook a bunch of machines up to the wheel and the wheel powers the machine. Um, what's the problem with that source of fuel, source of power? You have to be close to water. Yeah, that's one problem. There's another one. Pollutes the water? It pollutes the water to a certain extent, yeah. That's, that's a, another major one, but not the big one. What happens to the rivers in certain parts of the year? They dry, up. they dry up. Sometimes they get too strong. So the energy supply was inconsistent from week to week or month to month. So it's very limited. And you can see by this map, uh, the European population is not an industrialized population for the 1800s. They are moving in that direction where they have increasing amounts of people working in factories. But um, Britain becomes the first industrial economy where 51% of their workers are in factories somewhere in the mid-1800s, in the 1850s, and they are by far the leaders over the rest of Europe. Northern Germany starts to do it, France starts to do it, but they are always playing catch-up to the British for basically the whole century. So Britain is the kind of concentration of the Industrial Revolution at first, and that's one of the sources of their economic and military power. Because when you start building factories, you can make guns and bullets and boots and all that stuff much faster than your enemies, or your rivals, or competition, whatever you want to call them. So these are some nice images of working what one of these factories might look like. Uh, basically, you take a bunch of machines, you don't want to just give one person a machine in their house and say, you know, go ahead, you know, make stuff at your house. Uh, the investors eventually figure out that it's much more efficient to put all the machines in one building and bring the population to them to work. So, literally, factories are groups of machines under one roof, and sometimes these factories got fairly large. And entire cities rise in Britain based around factories. You know, they build the factory out next to a stream or something, just one little factory, then the workers start coming in, so the workers need a place to live fairly close by, so they can walk to work and you know work their 12, 14, 18 hour days, whatever it is, which is not uncommon. Um, and the people need a place to eat, so you know you get little like supermarkets and or markets of grocery markets and 
restaurants and stuff from back then. Of course, they built church in the area. So a lot of um, industrial towns literally rise up in the shadow of the factory. And they become towns that are completely centered on uh, the industrial working lifestyle. A uh, fairly nice picture of what it might have looked like to work in one of these areas. Um, very idealized, you know, things are clean, the sun is shining, people are smiling. <laughs> Which if you've ever talked to factory workers, people are often not smiling very much. Um, but this is a, a very nice image of what this may have looked like. And you can see that these buildings are very large compared to what Europeans had usually experienced before. I mean, most Europeans uh, before the 1800s lived in small towns or villages where you know, your house may be the size of this room or the large building in the town, a church would be the size of this room. So living amid, amongst something like this with so many people all crushed together is a new kind of psychological experience for a lot of people. Okay, uh, so water was unreliable source of fuel. Uh, there is one guy in the 1770s who figured out a more consistent source of fuel, which was also attached to water. He wanted to take a bunch of water and put it all in a, basically a giant tub, put a fire underneath it to heat the water, and then direct the evaporating water into one small place. So it's basically like when you're boiling water to make something to eat, you hold your hand over it, it feels hot. He wants to basically put a funnel over that to direct all the steam into one concentrated um, stream. And hook that up to the machines so that you get a steam-powered engine. And this guy's name is James Watt, so he starts measuring the amount of energy created by this system in what we now call watts. And if you ever pay attention to electricity measurements, you have all kinds of different electricity measurements, right? Watts, ohms, all kinds of things. And most of them are, uh, volts is another one, most of them are named after the inventors or the people who discovered a lot of these kinds of systems. Um, the problem of steam is that if you have like a gigantic tub of water, you need a lot of heat to keep it hot enough for the water to constantly boil to therefore make the consistent stream. So uh, wood was not good enough. Wood does not burn hot enough and long enough to be reliable. So they largely convert away from wood to coal. So they dig coal out of the ground, out of the mountains and whatnot, and put those uh, big coal plants underneath large tubs of water to build the steam engines. So coal becomes the next major source of fuel. And coal is still used today in a whole lot of places. And it's dirty stuff. This is where the giant pollution comes in. Uh, in industrialized towns, like uh, even Boston in the late 1800s, the 1880s, uh, there are reports that there are so many factories in some of these towns that the workers would go outside at around noontime in the summertime when the sun's supposed to be shining and it's dark where the street lights have to be on because of all the coal dust, coal clouds would block out the sun, literally. And they were having smog issues back then, huh? No, that's not smog, that's coal. Smog is well, you know, a, a, yeah, it's, it's a major, major problem. So you hear all these politicians talking about we're going to burn clean coal. <laughs> you ever picked up, picked up a piece of charcoal I mean, with your hand? There ain't nothing clean about that sucker. Uh, so they can say clean er coal, but anyone who's ever had any experience in one of these kinds of places knows there's no, there ain't no such thing as clean coal. But you can see the amount of coal produced just skyrockets after they start using steam engines to do a whole lot of this stuff. It just goes absolutely through the roof. And a lot of uh, countries that are today industrializing are relying on coal-powered plants, at the very least to produce electricity and then use the electricity to you know, make wall outlets and whatnot, power engines and machines with electricity, which the United States is still even doing in a huge amount. Most of our uh, electricity is powered by coal plants. Okay, um, the biggest symbol of the Industrial Revolution and of the steam engine in general is a locomotive. Uh, they eventually figure out that you can power transportation devices that could move huge amounts of weight 
if you just build a consistent track and uh, you keep some coal on board. So the locomotive is literally as it sounds. It is motion created locally, which means the car at the front is actually producing the energy by itself to pull the whole train. And uh, it becomes the major symbol of the Industrial Revolution and in Europe and in the United States. Because a lot of people who live out on the farms, who don't go to work in the factories and whatnot, their first experience of the Industrial Revolution is when the railroad is built through their region. And it's a psychological thing for a lot of people. It's a, it's a, it's a burden for a lot of people. It, it hurts people emotionally. Because remember, these are people whose relationship with the land goes back thousands of generations, all the way back to the earliest cities. I mean, these people's farming lines just hadn't changed very much in hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years. And all of a sudden, the railroad comes through, which literally scars the land with these tracks. And if you're living in an area where there's a valley between kind of two peaks, if the railroad has to go over that valley, they build a giant bridge. You live in an area next to a mountain. They will blow holes through the mountain. So this changes people's relationship with the ground that they have, their families may have lived on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And a lot of people have a hard time psychologically dealing with it. Um, probably one of the biggest examples of this is when one of these early railroads was built, uh, you know, they build it in Britain, and British politicians line up to you know, cut the ribbon and you know, show how great this system is. And you know, I voted for it, so I'm going to you know, re-elect me. Uh, one of the more popular politicians in Britain cuts the ribbon at one of the first train tracks built. And this train was known as the Bullet. It was going so fast that in the first run through the area, this guy is standing a little bit too close to the tracks and psychologically could not understand how fast this thing is moving toward him, and it killed him. Ran him down. Does anyone want to take a guess at how fast that train was going? About 30. <laughs> Which to us is stupidly slow, right? <laughs> if something's coming at you at 30 miles an hour from a great distance, um, most of us have the wherewithal to say, I'm standing on a track, Train's way down there. That's like, um, <laughs> you take a step back and let the train go by. But this is how different this experience was for people. They didn't have the reaction time to get out of the way. And you know, we, you know, I know you guys commonly drive 120 miles an hour down the freeway, or some talking on your phone at the same time. Um, we live in a very different world. And we laugh at this kind of stuff because it seems just so ridiculous. But to them, that was their experience. That is the kind of psychological break that these people have with what is being created around them. Some people just cannot deal with it. Does that make sense? And uh, this same kind of psychological break is probably going to happen in your time to you when the machines start taking over. <laughs> and when you start putting robots into your own body. And there are very strong predictions that by the 2030s, within the next 20 years, um, not only will you be putting robots in your own body, and I was just hearing about this on the news, they're trying to create um, disease-detecting devices that you could implant that would naturally break down in your own body, in your bloodstream, that would be able to detect the invasion of certain kinds of cancers and whatnot. But there's a prediction that in about 20 years, that you will not be able to tell the difference between a robot and a person. It is going to get that advanced. And what is going to happen to us? What is going to be our definition of human or citizen? Do you make the, the robot citizens? Do you, I mean, they're going to have their own thoughts. They're going to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. and, That's what we call Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> if you can trust that he's not a robot. <laughs> But uh, there's a real cool video called uh, a movie called Transcendent Man where this guy is literally thinking about this stuff right now. He's writing books about it. And there's a movie on his ideas. And uh, there's some really wacky predictions out there about what human interaction with these things is going to be. And I can show you a trailer for the movie. I keep it on my flash drive. Cause it's, every time I watch it, I, just, I think about it for days and days because there seems to be no way out. Let's watch. Revolt. Revolt won't do it. <laughs> 
because the robots will be smarter than us. The prediction is by the year 2030 that one computer will have more capacity than every single human brain in the world combined. So think about that for a minute. Let's, we will probably experience this in our lifetime. So you can laugh at these people because they couldn't understand. They couldn't cope. What are we going to do? And the bigger question is, what are the robots going to do to us? What's the movie called? Transcendent Man. <clears throat> came out a year and a half ago or something like that. It's on DVD. You can get it on Netflix. So I don't know. Documentary? Or documentary yeah. Movie? Documentary. It follows the guy around as he's giving speeches and has interviews with other scientists that are, you know, some of them believe what he says, some of them question it. And, um, when I first saw it, I, I thought about it constantly for about five days, and there's no way out that I can think of. There's a train on down. <laughs> what was that? I, didn't, I still didn't hear you. Use the train on down. They'll be running the trains. <laughs> yep. When you're dealing with a with a with a being that is more intelligent than all humans combined, they anticipate all your attempts before you even come to that theory. Yep. Okay, so this is what uh, did sum this up really fast. I'm going to try to get the marks. Um, <laughs> this is what people really thought the, the best kind of peasant lifestyle was like. You had your little house, uh, you had your little chickens, you went out and fed them, everything was nice and fun. Okay. Um, this is what London looks like by 1870. Very different experience. People are separated from the land. They're separated from the dirt because now they're paving all the streets and building these giant buildings. They don't see the ground, physical ground, very much anymore. And this is what we live in now, right? This is common to us. If you're driving down the freeway and looking at parts of L.A., parts of Ontario, I mean, you can look around and see this. This is our experience. You know, it's a very different feeling. And people complained about it. And this is all happening in a hundred years, just a few generations. A massive, huge change in people's everyday life from things that humans had experienced for thousands and thousands of years. So people have a lot of difficulty um, navigating this. Okay, uh, this also, these ideas become important not just for the economy, but it seeps down into the sciences and into philosophy. So they're not just starting to think about how do we uh, change into a mechanized uh, kind of productive world in factories. But what does it say about humans? What does it say about the natural world? Uh, they had al many people had already thought, they had noticed that evolution happens and that inheritance happens. Inheritance happens of certain traits. Like if uh, you know, I'm a tall, skinny person, if I marry a tall, skinny person and we end up having kids, our kids will probably end up, when they grow up, being tall, skinny kids, right? People understood that that tends to happen. And people understood that you know when two giraffes get get together, they tend to have baby giraffes. They don't they don't have baby elephants or anything. People understood that this was happening. So, uh, kind of proto scientists of the scientific revolution were trying to figure out how is that? Why does that happen? Why does it only happen when you have those same kind of children that resemble the parents? Um, so they understood that some kind of inheritance was going on, but they didn't understand how. So they started having these ideas of evolution. And uh, one interesting idea on evolution is this guy, a uh, French guy named Lamarck. Uh, he theorized that animals push their own evolution. That giraffes have long necks because a few giraffes saw some food way up high and they reached and extended their neck to get to the food. And then when they had children, they passed that longer neck trait onto their children because they had forced themselves to evolve. Or like a, a fish swimming upstream sees a real that, big, that piece of food, so it swims harder. <laughs> right? <laughs> Gets stronger fins. Has offspring, passes the stronger fins off to its offspring. Does that really happen? No. No. But this was his idea. So it, it's been called the kind of evolution of the will. We know instead there's a different kind of evolution. Where there is that kind of competition for resources... But Darwin's idea, published in 1859, in The Origin of Species, said it's not that you pass on the traits that, that you, know, you have strengthened yourself physically. 
It's based much more in the stronger or the quicker or the best adapted beings when the competition for resources. They tend to live longer and therefore have more children. And if that continues through the generations over huge amounts of time, thousands and thousands and thousands, if not millions of years, that all giraffes over time tend to have long necks because the one with the shorter necks had fewer kids and so they just kind of petered out over many, 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 many years. So you guys have heard of this natural selection idea, right? Okay, that's good. I'm glad I haven't had to explain it too much. All right. Some other philosophers start applying Darwin's natural selection theories to human society. Start saying that some humans are born smarter, stronger, faster, or more dedicated or single-minded or whatever you want to call it than others. And that those stronger and quicker and smarter tend to dominate society. So he called it the human survival of the fittest. And he starts calling this social Darwinism, Darwinism of human society. And the basic statement is, the people that are strongest or fastest or smartest, they tend to create wealth for themselves, prosperity somehow, by attacking their neighbors, by starting a business and having a good idea that you know, attracts money to them. And the rich, of course, tend to go into politics and dominate society that way. So Herbert Spencer's idea is the weak fall to the bottom, and the strong rise to the top in human society. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's the competition of people in a market or a society. And his idea, the cream rises to the crop, and the crap falls to the bottom. And he proposes to allow this to happen. He says, the strongest and the smartest should run society. They are the best of society. They have risen above the rest through natural, social, and economic competition. He says it's a good thing. So, and he says it's also a good thing that the weaker fall to the bottom. He says, let it happen. Don't intervene. And this is an inherently kind of conservative idea because it argues that the rich should be allowed to get everything that they get because they work harder and they're smarter, so they deserve it. And the poor deserve what little they get because they have been uncompetitive. And Spencer argues that government should not intervene to stop that. That government should not tax the rich because that's only hurting success. Sound familiar? And government should not support the poor because they deserve to be down there. So Spencer says, welfare programs, get rid of them. Why do you want to give money to the poor? They're uncompetitive, they're weak. It's a waste of money. Sound familiar? These ideas are prevalent today in politics. They don't want to talk about it so much anymore, but these are the core of some political ideologies. What is the main failing in Spencer's argument? that even he didn't really want to admit. There's more poor people than rich. <clears throat> well, there's more poor people, of course, yeah. But also, in human society, we are not just in cutthroat competition the way animals are for food, right? When I have those 20 cats in my backyard, and I have the one that I take into my house to feed, she's all nice and well-fed, and much bigger than the rest. But when she sees me feeding the rest, what does she do? She goes berserk, because she wants that food also. She's greedy, but that's what animals do. It's their survival mechanism. Do humans always do that? No, we have a moral choice to help others and to create a more equal and what some would say is a just society. So the idea of morality, Spencer didn't want to deal with that. He says, take your morality, throw it out the window because it's only harming society by taking from the successful and giving to the unsuccessful. So in a lot of ways, uh, you know, the, the more kind of liberal people who want to actually help others, who knew, um, <laughs> think that this is uh, just you know, grossly unjust. And you get these arguments today still, right? Going back and forth. Um, another major problem with Spencer's idea is he grows it and others increase it to be international competition, not just competition in, say, Los Angeles or California or the United States for dominance, 
but nations are in competition with each other. And because this gets involved with inheritance of natural abilities, intelligence, and strength, it starts getting also very racist, especially because it's developed by white Europeans who tend to think of themselves because they created the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, uh, French Revolutions, all that kind of stuff. The white Europeans assume that they are the ones that have the key, they are the best and the strongest and the smartest. Therefore, they are not only capable of dominating the world, but they should. They should go out and conquer these other world regions and subdue these other world populations to bring civilization to them. Does that make sense? And the Europeans are also in competition with each other because you know the German nation and the British nation are going to have to duke it out to see who's number one. So this leads to um, international struggles for dominance. Not just amongst cultures, but within cultures amongst different governments. And this leads directly into the world wars of the 1900s. And they start coming up with ideas that you know the, the weakest governments in Europe uh, should maybe just be eviscerated to you know knock out the leak, the weakest link in Europe so that the Europeans can rise up to even greater heights. So they start talking about you know the Austrian government is pretty weak; they're easy to kick around. Maybe we should just get rid of them. Or the Ottoman <coughs> government. We call the the Ottoman government the quote sick man of Europe, which means you know there's an inherent kind of weakness in that sickness. So maybe we should just euthanize, give that land to other governments knock out the weakest link. So this leads to international Darwinism, which is basically international warfare justified by a lot of these nationalist and racist interpretations. And it largely leads to slaughter of populations. Right? If that race is not as good as yours, maybe just wipe them out and take their land. And that's going to lead into massive, horrible human problems. So questions about Spencer at all? No. Okay, so he's a philosopher, called the social Darwinism. Darwin told Spencer, don't put my name on that thing, I hate it. Um, but it grew and you know, Darwin wasn't very happy about it. Okay, um, there's other sciences that rise up. You don't have to write all these down, but notice that they're now creating major disciplines as we know it now. And many of them are focused on helping people and eradicating things like disease. They start studying scientifically. Not just diseases that occur, but to start coming up with vaccinations that they can mass produce to knock out a whole lot of human misery and problems. Uh, so you get chemistry, uh, geology, trying to figure out where earthquakes come from, um, disease in general, sterilization of food, uh, pasteurization of things like milk. So there's a, a whole, I mean, this idea just quickly spreads out. And you get all kinds of rising new ideas. Um, this leads into the mid to late 1800s where a thing called the Second Industrial Revolution hits. And this is the shift from steam power to other sources. Um, steam was so powerful that uh, the old kind of material of building uh, iron had to be really strong to re for the machine to actually survive that consistent power from steam. Uh, iron, though, is very heavy. So it was tough to build fast-moving machines out of iron because the, the material is just very thick and heavy. Um, in the mid, I think it's the 1860s, uh, some inventors figure out that if you melt iron down, smelt it down to its kind of core, you get an even stronger metal that is, in fact, lighter than iron. This becomes steel. So steel starts becoming, it, it replaces iron in general as the major building material of the Industrial Revolution. Machines, housing, this is where you start getting big skyscrapers because the steel is much more powerful, much more resilient. So if you're out of land in your city, instead of building an apartment building outward to occupy more land, you build it upward. Uh, before steel, the biggest buildings you would get in Europe are, you know, usually maybe eight or ten stories. After steel, you can build a hundred stories. So the industrial landscape is changed again. Um, the machines move faster, and 
because steel is even stronger, they start looking to even more consistent and more powerful fuels to fuel the machine because the possibilities are growing. This is where you start getting the harnessing of electricity and the use of oil that is eventually made into, kind of melted down and refined into gasoline, which fuels machines and as automobiles start to rise in the late 1800s. Does that make sense? So it's a system that feeds on itself. Each new discovery provokes the next wave of discoveries. So uh, the second industrial revolution is a kind of chemical revolution where they figure out how to make steel, um, refine oil into gasoline, figure out how to harness electricity and um, you know, create batteries and whatnot for uh, direct power sources and machines. So this is growing, growing, growing. And the major steel maker of the world is named Andrew Carnegie. And when he corners the steel market in the United States, the biggest rising industrial power, Britain was first. Germany catches up, especially in the second industrial revolution era in the 1870s and 80s. So Germany becomes the biggest industrialized center, overtakes Britain in the late 1800s, and the United States takes over in the 19-teens. So the United States is on its way. And uh, Carnegie corners the steel market in the U.S. and becomes the richest man in the world. He was already wealthy enough. He was retired uh, by his 30s and um, knew what steel was going to do and bought up a whole bunch of steel plants and cornered the market. He was a steel monopolist. And he launched from being one of those retired guys with hobbies to being the Bill Gates of his time within just about 10 years or so. This is huge amounts of wealth. He had more money than he could ever spend in his lifetime, so he, to, he decided to give it away to charity. So he started his own charities and whatnot. And his theory behind doing this is called the Gospel of Wealth. He basically tell, he writes a, a short essay and publishes it throughout the world and tells the rich people of the world, uh, capitalism, investment, has given us as individuals great wealth. It is our duty to mankind to spend it for the benefit of those below us. So he is not one of these social Darwinist types of people. He wants to help others. He doesn't want to give them a paycheck. He doesn't want to give them direct cash because he says, you know, a lot of these workers in the factories, uh, they'll go off and spend it in the whorehouses and the bars and whatnot. So just giving them cash isn't going to help them very much. So he says, build libraries, give scholarships, build schools. And he does a huge amount of that in the Carnegie Institute. Is, they have their own university still today, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he spends a huge amount of his wealth. Uh, what percentage of his wealth does he have to spend before you consider him to be a nice giving person? Does he have to do like half, 10%? What do you think? 20%. 20%? Well, it depends on his money. He's the richest man in the world, so by far. Well, then 10% would probably be a lot. Yeah, 10% would be... Um, a, a gigantic amount. In his lifetime, while he is alive, he gives away 90%. Oh. Yeah. And that 10% he kept was enough for him to live very comfortably, right? And he's got many houses, he goes on vacation all the time, whatnot. And in his will, because he didn't want to leave the rest of the money to his relatives that are just sitting around waiting for the inheritance their whole life, they haven't accomplished anything, he gave the rest of it to charity. So he is probably one of the most benevolent people that has ever lived in terms of giving wealth away. So that's what he called the gospel of wealth, and that's one of the optional readings. A very interesting thing. Did the rest of the rich follow? No. A lot of them did. A lot of them gave away a lot of money. But um, you know, the people who rise to that level of wealth are usually pretty cutthroat types of businessmen who are obsessed with accumulating wealth. That's their drive in life. So a lot of them you know, think this guy's nuts. There's another interpretation of how to help the people. And this, again, is the big guy. Karl Marx grows up in what becomes Germany, eventually. Um, Germany is unified. It's brought together in 1871. So that 200 some odd countries is finally brought together to be one Germany in the 1870s. Uh, Karl Marx was born many decades before that. Uh, Karl Marx is 
was a PhD student, so got his bachelor's degree, then went for the big degree, the PhD, was writing his dissertation, finished it, and his dissertation was, it was in philosophy, that was his subject. So he is a big reader and a big thinker and a big writer. Gets his PhD in the 1840s and looks around the world at this Industrial Revolution and read Adam Smith very deeply. And Adam Smith's criticisms of the control of business by businessmen, monopolization, and their ability to control politics. And uh, he read Adam Smith and came to the conclusion that all the warnings that Adam Smith gave about capitalism and, ind and industrialization, because you know Smith predicted a lot of this stuff, right? He predicted the benefits and the bad side. Karl Marx says, in my time, the bad side has come to dominate. So Karl Marx uh, used Adam Smith's criticism and said, this has happened and it's horrible. So Karl Marx's his big statements start coming out in the 1840s and he continues writing books. Uh, some of He says a lot of different things about economics and society throughout his life. The biggest ones are the reemergence of slavery in Europe. He said feudalism is largely wiped out from Europe, not so much in Eastern Europe, but he's talking about the major industrial areas, Britain, France, Germany. He says we don't have feudalism anymore. We're not peasants serving lords anymore. Instead, the working peoples of Europe are now largely factory slaves. They go to work for their factory owner or manager. They work long hours in horrible conditions. You can see many of them are injured. That's why I like this picture to put next to Marx. Um, and he says that they are paid so little that they can never save enough money to get out. They are barely paid enough to have clothes to wear and food to eat. They are not paid enough to have their own homes because there's no minimum wage standards or anything like that in Europe at this point. So you can go work 12, 14, 18 hours a day in a factory, literally, next to children, and get paid very, very little because the unemployment rate is fairly high. If you complain, you're fired. Bring in the next person off the street. These machines usually don't take much skill to run. So Marx called this wage slavery. And he said this is hugely unfair to the working peoples of the industrial world who are actually making this stuff. Who gets all the profit out of this? The owners and the managers. The people who don't really do much work. They sit in their houses and collect their checks, right? So he says that industrialization has brought what he calls the accumulation of capital in fewer and fewer hands. All the money and wealth is being centralized in the factory owners of the world. And they control society. They control governments because they have so much money they can bribe politicians or give them campaign donations or something to get control over politicians to make sure there are no minimum wages. Or if you get hurt in the factory, there's no workers' compensation. You're thrown out in the street. You get your arm ripped off in a factory, you can't work anymore, maybe you starve to death. That's what it was like to be in the working masses. And a lot of people worked from maybe age five, went into the factory, because a lot of these machines, when they break down, they need small little hands to get in there and fix things. Sometimes adults can't do it. You know, Marx hates this system, and he says it has to be overturned somehow. Um, and Marx... Uh, defines two different groups in society. There are the owners, which he uses a French term, the bourgeoisie. They own the factories. They own the machines. They own what he defines as the means of production. They own the machines that make the physical goods that people use on a daily basis. They are the ones in control. And he says their lifestyle is pretty nice. They are so rich that they can spend their time walking through the park, going to parties and drinking wine, talking about philosophy, hanging out. Because they're so rich they don't have to work. And all of their wealth, he says, always comes from their dominance of the machines. 
They own them. Therefore, they are the rich in society. So that's the bourgeoisie. On the other side, you have the majority of people, which he defines as the proletariat. They are the factory workers and the farm workers who aren't getting paid much either. But largely the factory workers who go in to the factories at a young age and will basically work there until they die. There's no way out because they're paid so little. They have no money for housing, so they have to live like 20 people to an apartment or something like this. They can buy only the shoddiest clothes. They eat bad food. They have no protections from government. They live in dirty cities. There's unemployment everywhere, so it's a dangerous place to live because a lot of people turn to crime or prostitution or something like that to get enough money to survive. So these people have, in Marx's terminology, a pretty miserable life. And if you complain about it, you're fired. The owners go to great lengths to ensure that no unions ever break out in these places. Anyone who is even rumored to be thinking about starting a reunion is immediately fired, if not killed. And that happens also. So Marx says that the few are enriched and the many are left in this kind of system. They have a very different daily life. So questions about any of Marx so far? Pretty clear? I mean, this is Marx light. I mean, if you ever go there and read Karl Marx, it is very complex. And he uses very big words to describe this stuff. Yeah, try to break it down. But uh, yeah, he, he writes in a very complex way. If you ever read like big-time philosophers, they, they like to use big words. It makes them feel good. Okay. There is a general uprising of European peoples in 1848 against their political leaders, their kings. But also, these are also um, uprisings of industrial workers who have had enough of this crap. They don't like the economic system either. And 1848 is the big year of revolution. For Europe. Uh, literally 50 revolutions break out in different countries in Europe within just a few months. Of course, starting with France. The French are always the first to rise up against their own government. They do it consistently over and over again in the 1800s. Um, so there was an uprising in the area in one of those small little German states that Marx was living in. And some of the people leading the uprising went to Karl Marx because he is like the most educated guy in the area. And they said, uh, well, we know you don't like this economic system, so why don't you write a short book that we can give to the masses of Europe to inspire them to rise up and do something about this mess. So he does. Uh, he writes what becomes known as the Communist Manifesto. And he gives several demands. His, his, these are the very basics of his idea. Uh, number one, he says that we have to destroy the bourgeoisie. We don't have to go murder them in their beds or take their pillows or their, that kind of property or anything. He says this should be an uprising of the people to take away the most important part of property that they own. The means of production, the factories, the machines. <clears throat> so he says we're going after their property and when he uses the word property, he is overwhelmingly talking about the machines. Take away their factories. Why? Because they're running them to enrich themselves. They're not helping anyone else. It's unfair. So he's not saying go into their house and take their table or anything like that. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't even want to do that. He'll say if they resist giving up the factories, yes, then maybe you might have to go kill them. <laughs> but they have a choice. If they choose the wrong side of history, in Marx's view, you might have to knock them out violently. But this can be fairly nonviolent. Just rise up and tell them we're taking it back. He says, he defines capitalism as thriving on the exploitation of workers. He says that's how people get rich. They hire you to go out and do a job in bad working conditions for low wages. You work really hard. You're never able to save money because the owner is going to pay you as little as possible. So all the stuff you make in your working lifetime, it goes to sale at market or they sell all that stuff. You get a very small slice of that profit and the owner keeps most for themselves. He says, that is the idea of capitalism. That is the thesis. And he says, the problem with that is 
the masses of the population are so impoverished by this, there are so many of them living in misery, that this convinces the people to gather together to at least form unions, if not go into outright revolution against capitalism. So he says that capitalism, in his words, contains the seeds of its own destruction. The greed of the owners convinces the masses to rise up. So he says the rising up is the antithesis, the anti-capitalism. That's why he calls it the antithesis. So he says, capitalism has the thesis of exploitation, which directly leads to the antithesis. Does that make sense? Questions about that? That is a big, big, big idea. And he says, when the people rise up, they may have to do it politically and knock out their government. Marx wants them to create democracy. And he wants the government to run the factories. That's the key to communism. He says that the proletariat have to rise up, take control of the government. The government should run the factories because the government has objective. The government's not doing it to enrich one group of people over another. The government would equal out society. right? The government would give higher wages to the workers so that they can not only survive but prosper, drop the wages for whoever's still owning factories, if any, but communism wants most, if not all, the factories to be run by government. And if you have a democracy, guess what? If the people don't like the way the economy is being run, if the people don't like the way the factory system is being run, in the next election, vote the leaders out. Bring in someone else. So he called the communist revolution the victory of democracy. He said, this is what democracy leads to. And he says, no one country can do this by itself. And the first country that does this revolution is in danger. If France goes into the communist revolution first, what will happen? What happened in the French Revolution? All the other countries around that ganged up, right? to kill the French Revolution. Because the other capitalists in Britain or Spain or all those other places, they don't want to see this happen. Because that threatens their profit. So Marx predicted that when the first country does this, all the others will try to invade. So he says we can't just do this in one place at one time. And that's where he says all the workers of all the lands have to rise up at generally the same time and spread this revolution quickly. That's the only way to guarantee that it actually works. And that's where the famous ending quote, uh, the very last line of uh, this little book says, workers of all lands rise up at the same time. And 1848 was a general rising up. So he's very excited about this. Right? So question about any of these ideas. Okay. Moving on. The big book on this, the most famous book on this, is called Capital. Marx wrote this over many, many years. Um, Marx was a poor person himself who refused to work in the factories and was blacklisted from teaching. He had a PhD. He would have been a professor of philosophy at a university. Why is he blacklisted, do you think? Because of his political views. And who's in charge of universities? Who sits on the boards of directors of universities? Rich people. Industri uh, factory owners. They don't want this guy in their school. So he is literally blacklisted from teaching. He never teaches one day in his life, officially out of school. So he's unemployed basically his whole life. He writes capital on most of his other major works in public libraries, where he can go read books for free all day. Gets his library card, and he's kind of the uh, strange-smelling, quiet guy who uh, seems, seems to wear the same clothes day in and day out, and sits in the library all day, reading. And some days he goes and rents a typewriter. You know, the libraries used to have, just like computers today, where you just go up and use their typewriter. And he wrote his books in public. And uh, eventually, he's even kicked out of a whole bunch of different countries. He eventually uh, lives in London for most of his later life. And he writes these things in the London public library system. But capital is the big one. Again, largely starts off with the complaint that feudalism was killed off and was just replaced by the capitalist system which creates wage slavery, so the, the mass of workers are still basically enslaved by the rich. The big key to capital, he says the capitalist system will destroy itself because the capitalists are too damn greedy to understand the long-term consequences of what they're doing. He says capitalism thrives 
on the economic competition for profit. Basically, if you have 10 or 20 different businesses all selling the same, I don't know, clothing or water bottle in society, they're all in competition with each other. So what do they do to knock each other out? They lower their prices. They Walmart at each other. One by one, companies go out of business. Eventually, to the point where you're left with maybe five or three or two, or in the worst instance, one company selling that product in society. A monopoly. And he calls this the accumulation, the, nat the natural tendency of capitalist accumulation or something like that. It's the most famous chapter of the book, like chapter 34 or something. Um, but he says that the natural ramification of this, the natural result, is that the capitalists who are put out of business, where do they go work? They go work in the factories. Uh, probably one of the best examples from today is uh, you have a local grocery chain around here in California called Stater Brothers, right? Mm -hmm. They've been around for a long time. But who else has started to sell groceries? Target and Walmart, the big chains, the worldwide chains. Target and Walmart have so much revenue, they can drop their prices below Stater Brothers prices, right? Because if you're buying two water bottles that are basically the same thing, one of them costs 50 cents less, which one do you buy? People tend to buy the cheaper one if it's generally the same quality product. So, you know, if I was running Stater Brothers, I'd be pretty scared. If I was working for Stater Brothers, I'd be pretty scared. Because Walmart is a monopolistic company. And this is what they do. They knock out smaller market rivals. They've been doing it for many decades now. But say Walmart does knock out Stater Brothers eventually. Stater Brothers has a lot of employees, right? Where do those people go work if the only company left selling groceries is Walmart? They go work for Walmart because that's where they've worked their whole lives. That's what they're experts in. So they become wage slaves also in Marx's kind of analogy. So he says that the few that are rich gets fewer and fewer and fewer as businesses get put out through competition and you get monopolies. Eventually to the point that the mass majority of workers in society are wage slaves, they're proletariat. And he says, as you get close to like 98, 99% of society are wage slaves, one day they walk outside their door and they look around at their whole city and they say, what the hell? All of us are living in poverty and misery and basic slavery. And this is what he calls the rise of class consciousness. The people start to look around and say, wait a minute, everybody is poor. We are all of the same class. Why are we working so hard to give so much profit to the richest, like, tenth of one percent or something like this? And he says, at that point, the people will rise up. It may not happen today or tomorrow, but he says, eventually. It will happen. He says, this is economic fact. There is no denying it. He says, this is science, as he considered economics to be. A hard science that is proven by the evidence. This will happen at some point. Even if the first one fails, you know, France rose up in a revolution, got attacked on all sides, got taken out. But it didn't stop the idea of revolution, did it? Didn't stop the idea of liberty or equality. Didn't stop the idea of democracy. And Marx says, eventually, this idea will spread even if the first instance of it is strangled at birth by the capitalists. And that's, what he, that's why he says, the accumulation of wealth into fewer and fewer hands will kill capitalism eventually. Because the masses will realize what's happening and they will rise up. It is unavoidable. Does that make sense? All right. So what does he want the revolution to look like? He calls it the expropriation. When he uses that word, and he uses it over and over again, it means taking away. That's his kind of interpretation of it. So that's an example of a big word that means a fairly simple thing. And he, he does this constantly. So he says that the first expropriation was when the capitalists created machines and took your ability to make clothes and whatnot from the people and gave it to themselves, right? He took the mean, they took the means of production and dominated themselves. They take away the people's livelihood to make things for themselves. That's the first expropriation. And he talks about enclosure. 
of land as being a part of that. So he calls for a new expropriation, which is basically the people rising up and taking all that stuff back. So that's his revolution. He calls it the expropriation of the expropriators, which again is a complex term that means a fairly simple thing. The key for him with communism is when you take that property, the means of production from the bourgeoisie, you don't give it to another group of elites. You give it to the government so that the people in general can decide how to run this stuff. And he had ideas, you know, the factory workers know how to run the factories most efficiently, so they should be the ones making the kind of smaller level decisions about output and whatnot. But the government is the one that makes the big decisions. The government should own all the means of production so it can run it efficiently, objectively, and for the equal benefit of all peoples. And this is where he starts talking about there will no longer be a rich and a poor, everyone will be equal. So he says, we are not giving it back to another group, we're giving it to everybody through government. And if you have democracy, if you don't like the way government's running the economy, vote them out. Bring in someone else. And again, he calls this inevitable, historically and scientifically proven, and he calls this the victory of democracy. He says this is where democracy tends towards. Does all that make sense? Questions about any of this? These are big, big ideas that have changed the world and have had deep impacts in the way people view economics. And especially in the 1900s when you get communist governments rising, they don't always follow this plan, right? A lot of them don't create democracies. He was saying that people should just create their own government, right? Well, people always create their own government. He read John Locke, and you know, people come together, form a government to protect their rights and whatnot. He says this is the logical end point of it. This is where it goes. It may take some time, may take some bloodshed, but this is where it's going. Who was in charge now? Or before? Before. Like, is in, where are they at in Europe? Who's in charge? Who is he talking about? Just Europe? All He's talking about everybody in the world. He doesn't locate this just in Europe. Uh, he says that eventually, like, his plan is for the most industrialized society to rise up first because they have enough machines, even during the revolution, to still produce enough clothes and whatnot for people to survive. He doesn't want the revolution to hit in some kind of backward economy that's still mostly farmers or anything like that. He says that would be tragic. And the sad thing is that's where it does start, the Russian Revolution. They're they are a 1700s economy in the 1900s. So he wanted this to happen in, say, northern Germany or Britain or the United States or maybe in France. And he says, once it starts there, it has to spread quickly or else you're going to get a conspiracy of the capitalists to kill it. So other questions? Yeah? Um, was this idea first kind of started by Thomas More that the utopia... Yeah, um, without the factories, right? Yeah. Without More had the idea that people should be equal and get equal resources for equal work and that kind of stuff. Uh, but he gives a, a, a much stronger spin on it because he saw with the machines the opportunity. I mean, utopia is a kind of dreamlike kind of, you know, everyone should theoretically be equal. He says, now that we have the machines that do most of the work and can produce enough food and clothes and tables and all the stuff that people need and use, we can actually do it. But the, the downside of all those factories is that they're dominated by the few, the greedy few. So, other questions? All right, we'll stop there.